All right, everyone, this is Mr. Pete. We are going to be reading part two of The Wednesday Wars by Gary D. Schmidt. Before we do that, let's jump back and talk about what happened at the beginning of May. And of course, the beginning of May, we found out that Lee's dad won the job. He didn't even win the job. He was given the job to help remodel Yankee Stadium. And Yankee Stadium, by many people, has been called the Cathedral of Baseball Stadiums. Today, it's a brand new stadium. It's not the same one that was there in 1968. Sometime within the past 20 years, a new Yankee Stadium was built right across the street from the old Yankee Stadium, still considered one of the most storied baseball franchises, therefore storied stadiums of all time. Obviously, it's not the same stadium that Babe Ruth played in, and Lou Gehrig played in, and Joe DiMaggio played in, and Babe Ruth played in, and of course, Joe Pepitone and Horace Clark, but still has all of those memories tied to it because it's still, of course, Yankee Stadium. Um, we also had Holling's sister run away from home with her boyfriend and dad kind of flipping out and basically blaming her for everything and saying she better not ask for help. And of course, his reaction was to go and buy a 1968 white convertible Mustang that Holling loves. And the Atomic Bomb Awareness Month where they're diving under their desks to, you know, protect themselves from an atomic bomb blast. Because that's what desks can... Our desks are specially built for that. Not really. All right. Mrs. Baker, I love this. She's sick of these stupid tests. So she decides on a Wednesday during this test to take Holly on a field trip to look at architecture in the town that they live in. And what's shocking about this is Holly does like the idea of being an architect, but doesn't want to be forced to be an architect. And what's ironic about this is Holling's dad is an architect and clearly hasn't done this with him yet. Maybe someday he would have, but Mrs. Baker, separate of the dad, is going to take Holling on this really neat experience. We walked together to the main administrative office where all the secretaries were scrunched up under their desks, and Mrs. Baker explained to Mrs. Sidman that our classroom smelled like a brewery, and that she certainly did not think that she could keep a student there, and that she would like to take the opportunity to go on a field trip while Mr. Vendelary cleaned the room. Mrs. Sidman had one eyebrow raised the entire time she was listening, but Mrs. Baker had her arms crossed, and you know how convincing that can be. So Mrs. Sidman agreed, and Mrs. Baker filled out a form, and one of the secretaries crawled out from beneath her desk and called my mother, and then we got into Mrs. Baker's car, and she drove me around and showed me all the points of local architectural interest. We crossed over the Long Island Expressway to the north side of town, and meandered down side roads until we stopped beside the Quaker the Meeting House. This was built in, in five 1676. Years the Act, Think of that, some, but not all When it was built, people were still England living who had been alive when that freedom was extended to include was a small English colony in what is now years ago, It was there, a the station Society of Friends on the Underground a Meeting Railroad. House. Escaped Today, slaves hid right there. The Friends Quaker Meeting House remains practically unchanged on Northern Boulevard. It's more than three centuries old. Quakers were here uh, before New York was New York. The Friends Meeting House is New York City's oldest house of worship in continuous use and the second oldest in the nation. Before its building in 1694, services were held in the kitchen of John Bow, a few blocks away. He's now buried in the graveyard behind the meeting house. The Quakers, when they were founded, they were very concerned about not living a worldly life. And so rather than have their meeting house facing the world and where all the business was, you came around to the back, to the entrance. 
Times were much different back then, to say the least. Quakers preached equality of the sexes, though that was hard to bring to fruition in a patriarchal society. The women would go through what was once the women's entrance, and then the men would come in on this side to the men's entrance. We have uh, pretty much um, gone beyond that tradition, and now women and men sit together uh, here in this worship space. In 1717, the Quaker congregation grew so rapidly it was time to add on. Those renovations stand today, too. Here are two of the knees, the ship knees I was telling you about here, which is the root system and the trunk of the tree. The meeting house has served its original purpose for more than 300 years, interrupted only during the American Revolution when British troops occupied the building. Legend has it that they chopped up and burnt the original pews, and so these were pews that were um, replacing the original pews, uh, and they were built actually by individual Quaker families for their own um, seating. And while some pieces of the meeting house history is charming. Here we have the work of some bored Quaker children, uh, 1821. It looks like a heart, somebody is heart here as well. Other parts are monumental. George Washington became here, he worshipped with us twice. Once during the revolution, early in the revolution, and why once when he was president. The landmark property still hosts meetings for worship every Sunday. It's a place where people of all faiths are welcome to practice in peace and break bread together. Reporting in Flushing, Queens, I'm Kayla Mamalak, Fox 5 News. We meandered down more side roads. That's the first jailhouse on Long Island, Mrs. Baker said. It has two cells, one for men and one for women. The first man to occupy the cell had stolen a horse. The first woman had refused to pay the church tax because she was not a member of the church. She wanted to define freedom for herself. Think of that. You can see the bars in the windows where she would have looked out. Imagine, now who could you compare that girl to who was in that jail wanting to think for herself? We drove out to the east side of town and circled Hicks Park. This has changed a great deal over the years, but it was once Hicks Common, where the first settlers of the town grazed their cows and sheep. These larger oaks, no, the oaks hauling, over there, were probably saplings then. And the building backing up against the park, that clapboard building there, is St. Paul's Episcopal School, where British soldiers were housed during the American Revolution. The silver communion ware it owns was made by Paul Revere, and one of the original Hicks family members hid it in a cellar so it wouldn't be stolen during the war. So Paul Revere, I hope you know the story of Paul Revere, who famously yelled, the British are coming, the British are coming, while riding his horse, alerting people in Boston that uh, the British were indeed coming uh, to, you know, in during the American Revolution. But Paul Revere was famous prior to that. He was famous for a lot. He was a dentist. He was a, um, a blacksmith. He was a silversmith. He was a, a newspaper man, a journalist. He, he did a lot of very famous things over the course of his life. But the most famous thing was letting the colonial Minutemen know that the British were indeed coming so that they could be ready for them. The other thing that he did was he created a press, uh, a silver press, that let everybody know about the Boston Massacre. He also was a son of liberty, uh, one of the sons of liberty. The sons of liberty fought this kind of battle with the British soldiers and British period to let them know we weren't going to pay for taxes. They were part of the Boston Tea Party. They were part of letting people know across the colonies what was going on with the British. And, of course, eventually turned into the American Revolution. On the south side of town, we passed Temple Emmanuel. That is the fourth temple on the same site, said Mrs. Baker. The first building was burned by lightning, the second by British soldiers who found out the congregation was supporting the revolution, and the third by arsonists. In all those fires, the ark holding the Torah was never damaged, 
it's still there today. And on the west, on the far outskirts of town, we drove past what looked like a garden shed. The first abolitionist school, Mrs. Baker said, where Negro children could come to learn to read and write and so escape the ignorance that slavery wanted to impose. Right there, Holling, is the true beginning of the end of slavery. I never knew a building could hold so much inside. On a bright blue day, when there wasn't an atomic bomb on any horizon, when the high clouds were painted onto blue canvas, when tulips were standing at attention and azaleas were blooming, except for the ones in front of the perfect house, and dogs were barking at all the new smells, I saw my town as if I had just arrived. It was as if I was waking up. You could see houses and buildings every day, and you walk by them on your way to something else, and you hardly see. You hardly notice they're even there, mostly because there's something else going on right in front of your face. But when the town itself becomes a thing that is going on right in front of your face, it all changes, and you're not just looking at a house, but at what's happened in that house before you were born. That afternoon, driving with Mrs. Baker, the American Revolution was here. The escaped slaves were here. The abolitionists were here. And I was here. It made me feel sort of responsible. So hauling in that moment, you wanna talk about growing up and you wanna talk about level six and you wanna talk about the points in this story where he stops thinking about himself. Here he's realizing that this town, this place where he grew up has so much history. What's inside is important. Think about his house, what's inside his perfect house is important, not so perfect. But what's inside all of these other buildings, the history of his town, and he starts to feel the weight of it. Like all of these things happened. The ending of slavery began right here in a, a lot of different ways. People saved the Torah this many times from this many things because it means so much to them. The weight of this town, the weight of history is starting to kind of land on his shoulders a little bit. And he's okay with it, more than okay with it. Before we got back to Camillo Junior High, we passed St. Adalbert's, built almost a century ago with the pennies of Italian immigrants, said Mrs. Baker. Let's go in, I said. Mrs. Baker paused. Would your parents approve, she asked. It's a point of local architectural interest, I said. So we went in. It was the first Catholic church I'd ever been inside, mostly because Catholic churches are supposed to be filled with idols and smoking incense that would make you so woozy that you'd give in and start praying on your knees which Presbyterians know is something that should not be done. But it wasn't like that at all. We came in, Mrs. Baker dropped some money into the offering box, and we walked down the main aisle. The afternoon light slanted down through the high windows so that up close to the ceiling, the air was flecked with glowing gold specks. Down below where we were, it was shadowy and warm. I ran my hand over the dark wood of the pews, worn smooth, there was no carpet, so we could hear our own footsteps as we walked toward the altar, where a crucifix hung suspended, a pale white Christ with bright red wounds. For a hundred years, people have been coming together in this dark, I thought, breathing quietly and evenly. For a hundred years, it made me wonder. Whew. Mrs. Baker, I said. Yes, Holling. I have a question. Yes. Doesn't have anything to do with points of local architectural interest. That's all right. After the game at Yankee Stadium, when Mel Stottlemyre took you up to meet the boss, did you ask him to have Kowalski and Associates do the renovations so that Marilee could stay? A pause. Whether or not I spoke about the renovations to Yankee Stadium is not something you need to know, Holly. Then I have a second question. Does this one thing have anything to do with points of local architectural interest? Yes. What is it? 
If an atomic bomb drops on Camillo Junior High, everything we've seen today will be gone, won't it? Another long pause. Yes, she said finally. And it really doesn't matter if we're under our desks with our hands over our heads or not, does it? No, said Mrs. Baker. It really doesn't matter. So why are we practicing? She thought for a minute. Because it gives comfort, she said. People like to think that if they're prepared, then nothing bad can really happen. And perhaps we practice because we feel as if there's nothing else we can do, because sometimes it feel as if life is governed by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Is there anything else we can do? She smiled, not a teacher smile. Two things, she said. First, learn to diagram sentences. And it is rude to roll your eyes all night. Learn everything you can, everything. And then use all that you have learned to grow up, to be what? I'm gonna leave this in here because this is, if you wanna talk about why I teach, this paragraph is everything. So I'm gonna start over. But I want you to see that because it's hard for me to get through it because it's exactly when people always say, Mr. Pete, why? Like, why do we have to learn this? This is what I want you to remember as students in my class. Two things, she said. First, learn to diagram sentences. And it is rude to roll your eyes, Holling. Learn everything you can, everything. And then use all that you have learned to grow up, to be a wise and good man. That's the first thing. As for the second, I lit a candle in a Catholic church for the first time that afternoon. Me, a Presbyterian, I lit a candle in the warm, dark, waxy smelling air of St. Adelbert's. I put it beside the one that Mrs. Baker lit. I don't know what she prayed for, but I prayed that no atomic bomb would ever drop on Camillo Junior High or that Quaker meeting house or the old jail or Temple Emmanuel, or Hicks Park, or St. Paul's Episcopal School, or St. Adelbert's. I prayed for Lieutenant Baker, missing in action somewhere in the jungles of Vietnam near Khe Sanh. I prayed for Danny Hupfer, sweating it out in Hebrew school right then. I prayed for my sister, driving in a yellow bug toward California. Or maybe she was there already, trying to find herself. And I hoped that it was okay to pray for a bunch of things with one candle. There's Holling thinking of the world instead of him. He's growing up. That afternoon when I came back home, the station wagon was gone and the Mustang was gone and the whole house was empty. Even the mailbox was empty except for a flyer for my sister from the Robert Kennedy campaign announcing that he would be stopping on Long Island before the New York primary, my sister would have flipped. And I realized that the biggest part of the empty in the house was my sister being gone. Maybe the first time that you know you really care about something is when you think about it not being there. And you know, you really know that the emptiness is as much inside you as outside you. For it so falls out that what we have, we prize not to the worth, whiles we enjoy it. But being lacked and lost, why, then we rack the value, then we find the virtue that possession would not show us while it was ours. That's when I knew for the first time that I really did love my sister, but I didn't know if I wanted more for her to come back or for her to find whatever it was that she was trying to find. See, this is the kind of stuff you start to think about when you're reading Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. You just can't help being kind of melancholy. Great word. Even though if you had to play him on stage at the festival theater, at least you'd be a prince and wearing a black cape instead of being a fairy and wearing yellow tights. And that's why when my sister called that night, long after my mother and father had gone to bed, when she knew that I would be the only one awake to pick up the phone, I started to cry right away. And she did too. 
both of us not saying anything, just crying into the telephone. What jerks. Somewhere in between all the crying, I heard that she was in Minneapolis, which I guess is on the way to California, that she was alone, that she had exactly $4 left in her pocket, that she didn't know what she was going to do since a bus ticket to New York City cost $44.55, that I couldn't ever, 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 ever tell dad or mom that she called because she couldn't bear to hear what they would say to her and she wasn't sure if they even would say anything to her and what was she going to do now? I guess she hadn't found herself. Where are you? I said. In the bus station. How else do you think I'd know that a ticket to New York City cost $44.55? Is there a Western Union window there? Of course there's a Western Union window here. All bus stations have a Western Union window. She paused a moment. I guess she was looking around. Hauling? Yes. I don't see a Western Union window here. The operator told us that we were almost out of time and we should deposit 35 cents for another three minutes. I don't have any more coins, yelled my sister. Go to the nearest Western Union station tomorrow morning, I said quickly. Out! Then the phone went dead. All because of a stupid 35 cents in coins. Like Bell Telephone was going to go bankrupt because of one phone call from Minneapolis to Long Island in the middle of the night. And that is where we are going to stop today. Um, there is so much to take in that. Hauling on this field trip, gosh, learned so much about the town. Um, we learned just how much Mrs. Baker cares about him. Like, she takes him on a field trip. I mean, she doesn't want to be doing this bomb thing. She goes with him on this field trip, and she tells him about all of these amazing places. Not just the Catholic Church. She takes him, of course, to a Catholic Church. She takes him to a, a temple, and she talks about the history and the depth. And she talks to him down, like giving him this advice that he, you can tell he's carried forever whenever he's telling this story and, you know, him realizing all of these things that have weight, that if atomic bomb goes off, it's all gone. And then him praying in a Catholic church, he's not Catholic, but you can almost see, well, if my dad's Presbyterian, I can do other things. So in that church, he lights a candle and he wishes for all of these amazing things, for all of these other people, not himself. And then, like clockwork, his sister calls, and he's there. And he doesn't, remember, when he only had $3.78, she helped him and didn't help him at the same time. But you can see, she only has $4, she needs $45. And he, without question, tries to help her. Now, did she hear what he said? Will he get the money to her? Does he have the money? We shall find out. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. Tomorrow, it's only peace. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die.